Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning study for a new week of studies. I'm not going to be here for one of them, but uh, they'll still happen every morning, the regular time. Now, before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have this week to open your word together, to examine uh, Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, and chapter 12 today, where we look at the connections between the historical application of these prophecies and the events that are happening presently in this movement. We ask that your Holy Spirit can guide us and direct us in these studies and that we can see clearly uh, things that you have uh, to say to us. We pray for each person that you can bless them. Help us in our trials, in our struggles, in our difficulties uh, that we face each day in this world of sin and suffering. We pray for our families and friends. We ask, Lord, that um, uh, you can use us to your glory. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So on uh, Thursday morning, we were looking at this time, times and a half, and trying to understand the present truth application of this passage. Now, uh, the question really had to do with how long, what what that question means in the context of the present. So when we have the how long questions, we, we see one in Daniel 8, 13. We see one here in Daniel chapter 12. I guess that's verse five. And um, then we see uh, another one in, um, in in Revelation chapter six, dealing with the end of the 1260 years of papal persecution. So when we have a how long question, and, and there are some other how longs in, in scripture too, but ones that are given a period of time. So 12, 1230 or 1260 here and also that would be the answer to uh, chapter six as well, even though they don't specifically say it, say it, 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 it still has to do with that 1260 year period. And then the 2300 days, 2300 years. So why is there a question of how long? If we, we think about this question, how long? And then we try to relate what it would mean to this movement. So is that question how long something that we, we can place in our history? I guess is the question. Now the question here, how long shall be the end of these wonders? Any, any thoughts on that? Okay, so when we deal with the word wonders, so let's look at some of these um, these words here. We, we have to ask the question, does this uh, relate in any way to, um, yeah, so that's actually in verse six where they ask the question on verse five. So we've got how long to the end of these wonders, and that word wonder 6382, a pele, a miracle, a marvelous thing. There, this word is related to palmoni, by the way, and we'll see how that is, because we know the wonderful number has that uh, root in it. Now, it's kind of interesting if we look up the, the word numbers or, or the word wonders, and the first place we're going to see it is in Psalm 77, 11. So that's kind of interesting. Say, now we'll remember thy numbers, their, thy numbers, thy wonders of old. So you got the Hebrew number there, 6382. So 7711, you can see there symbols that we have connected to our lines, 77 and 11. And, and we know we have 17 times 11 is, is 187. Anybody know what 77 times 11 is? So 77 times 11 is, and, and you know how you do that? If you wanted to do that math in your head quickly, you would um, you would uh, take seven and seven and put it on either side, and then you would double. You would add the seven and seven together to get fourteen, and then you would take the one and carry it over to the seven on the left side. So you would have eight four seven. It's a easy easy to learn how to anything that's multiplied by eleven. It's really easy to to do in your head. 
you just do some addition. You don't really have to multiply. But anyway, it's 847. Um, not that I know that there's anything particular about that number, but I'm just saying we have the 77 and we have this 11, which uh, is an important symbol. We also have it in Psalm 8812, Psalm 77, 14. 7 plus 7 is 14. And Psalm 88 to 10. So it, it seems that these, and, and also Psalm 119, which is a symbol of 911, verse 129 is 896, etc. So this, this word wonders is, oh, what happened there? So as a question. Yeah. The first time the phrase how long is occurring in the Bible is Exodus ten three. Okay. Does yeah. that, does that along with Exodus ten seven have anything to do with what we're looking at here? Okay. So um how long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me and uh um and uh ten seven. Ten seven. Oh there it is. How long shall man be a snare unto us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, you know, so the one is in 10.3, that's, that's, um, that's God speaking. The other one is, you know, Pharaoh's servants, right, speaking. Because the next time that we have God speaking, using this phrase, how long, is yeah. Numbers 14.27. Yeah, Numbers. I mean, there are some other ones that I know are significant, but... Uh, but usually when I, when I look at the how long it, it's a question usually in asked in reference to some kind of period. Right. So these ones are not necessarily the same. Like they're not addressing a prophetic period, but so another thing dealing with, uh, wonders, it's also in Psalms, uh, uh, July 18 verse 2020. I mean, Psalm 78 verse 12, you know, obviously the 18s backwards, but, uh, see that there um but just dealing with this so so i'll I'll look at that how long in a little little bit more detail later so when we're dealing with this uh gotta go back here so these wonders and we got here so this word six three eight one if you remember that that word pala was uh connected with the story of i can't think of his name I'll find it here in a sec. So 63, so 6382 is wonders. 6381, we have that in, yeah, it's in, yeah, this is it. Judges 13. So we had looked at it back then. Yeah. So this is, uh, addressing, um, the offering of Manoah. So the angel did wondrously and Manoah and his wife looked on, right? So, so this is going to deal with the birth of Samson. And we had looked at this, this word wondrously, and we saw that it has this connection to, uh, the wonderful number, right? So Pala 6381 and 6382. So the wonderful number, Palmoni, is related to this word. So that's the wonderful part of wonderful number, right? So, so the question then, uh, relating to our lines, how what uh how long shall be the end of these wonders and and that how long is that same phrase that you saw in the other ones so what would be the significance of 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 this word here six three eight two the wonders so if it's related to the wonderful number and we're trying to relate this to our time, how would we connect this so we got this can we connect this to our lines through this word wonders? Would it have to do with a period of time in our lives? And if so, how would we connect that? Okay, no, no thoughts on that. What should we wonder? How wonders relates to pa- Palmoni. So the being Palmoni, uh, movement, how yeah, the wonders so, relate to the movement. Yeah. So how does it relate to the movement? How would we connect this? The six three eight two. I would say the information, maybe information uh, that the Lord gave. Okay. Yeah, but so if we're, can we just say that this wonders represents Palamoni, that there is a period in which this movement has been given to deal with numbers. That's, that's, that, that is a prophetic period. Or would we look at 
you know, a 1260 day period in our history and say that that relates to it. Oh, I, I gotcha. Right. That's what I'm, I'm trying to, to get at. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we already have, you know, dealt with uh, the Capes, the end there, 7093, um, in other places. So I don't know. I'm not sure what to do with that. I mean, we obviously have wonders. So we know that this has something to do with time, with the wonderful number, but just exactly yeah. how we use this symbol. That's what I don't know. Now, we know that in, res in, in response to this question, there's a, a number of things that we have to consider. So the first thing is uh, we have this man clothed in linen, which uh, was upon the waters of the river. So the man clothed in linen, I mean, we know that this is Christ. So we have Christ. He's going to be upon the waters of the river. It's on the waters. And okay. waters represent, waters represent uh, people. Well, well, yeah. So normally we look at waters and they represent people. But they can also represent a message. Yeah, true. So, so you know, we... we, we you know, the waters in Revelation later, you know, people's multitudes, nations, tongues, and people. But but here, this would be a message. Now, we know that we can compare this message to Millerite history because, I mean, this is going to be addressing specifically Millerite history. So we're, we're going to see Revelation chapter 10 connected to this. So the book is going to be sealed, right? This is when this book is going to be opened. And so we have this this parallel vision they're different but they have some similarities so they relate to each other now this is relating to the 1260 years of paganism right the one that's in uh, daniel or revelation chapter 10 is dealing with the 1260 years ending in 1798 and the millerite history that follows so so here there but there still is this connection even even with this first period of 1260 because in order for this first period of 1260 to, in order for the second period, the 1290 and the 1335 to occur, this period has to end, right? So the how long here has to do with this first period. And, and so we would try to have to, we'd, we'd have to figure out how does this relate to our history? And, and I haven't had an answer to it yet, right? So, I mean, I've been examining first this, period. thinking about first it. Period of it. You mean the first period of FFA, and then well, end, yeah, ending 18th. maybe yeah. uh, eight eighteenth, uh, July eighteenth. Yeah, I don't know if we would even put it that late, right? Because if we're looking at Millerite history, this this would be more. It's going to end at the time our history begins. That's the way that oh, I yeah. more. So I think it is. It's there must be some other way in which this connects. That and and I'm trying to look at the, the symbols here. So we know that that there is a time in which the book of Daniel it's going to be shot and it's going to be opening up at the time of the end. Now the time of the end, of course, is the end not of this time times and a half, but it's going to be the end of the 1290. So Daniel is being given this information, and we have to remember that Daniel in this context, that he's being given understanding about the 2520. That's primarily the thing that he doesn't understand yet. He understands the matter, that is the 70 weeks. He already understands those. In chapter 10, he has that understanding. And also, he has an understanding of the vision. That is the, the Mara, the evenings and mornings, right? What he what he needs to understand is the chazon. So he hasn't he hasn't put that together yet prior to uh, this vision, Daniel's last vision. Now, in order to put that together, he's going to be utilizing uh, his understanding of Daniel chapter nine and Daniel chapter eight to expand on this, right, where the angel is going to use that understanding. So he, he's all of this history that he's reviewing is relating to uh, initially in, in in Daniel chapter 11, it's it's confirming what he's already knows. But now he's going to come here to chapter 12. He's going to be given the end of the indignation, the last end of the indignation. He's being shown these periods of time. 
And then um, he's going to be shown the end of time, all of these things being wrapped up. And then he's going to be told that he, the words need to be shut up and the book has to be sealed until the time of the end. Right. We know that time of the end is 1798. Right. That's the context for the book of Daniel, the time of the end. And that his book is going to be understood. And we could relate that in our history to the seven thunders being sealed up and then unsealed in our history. Right. So we can take Millerite history. We can say that Millerite history is going to be sealed in those seven thunders. That's the history that's being shown here, right? It's going to bring us to Millerite history in Daniel chapter 12. We're going to have this, the seven thunders in our history, right? So, so we can, we already have, have done that. So the people running to and fro and knowledge being increased in our history has to do with the light that's unfolding in our history. So then if we go back to the historical application, so he's going to have this vision. Right now, this is going to first address. So we have to look at this thing all together. So first, he's going to be shown that that the the twelve sixty four that is half of the twenty five twenty has to first be fulfilled for paganism. That is the scattering, the scattering of the power of the holy people. That is going to be under paganism, right? And if we think about the seven times. Well, time times and a half is half of the seven times. That's why they're called times. Now, here it's the word moed, you know, so some people argue that you can't just take the seven times and connect it to this. But it definitely is connected because this is 1260 years and there's 2520 years that this is a part of. So in a sense, you can build the 2520 from the two 1260s, right? That's what we understand. But he has to accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people, and all these things shall be finished. Now, can we apply that in our history, the scattering of the power of the holy people? Does something have to occur first before we get, you know, to our history? Because because this is something that has to happen first before you get to Millerite history. And so the question is, what is the parallel to the scattering of the power of the holy people, I guess, if you want to? To answer that question, the message, how long? The message, uh, message been scattered the four generations. Okay, so the four generations of Adventism? Yeah, maybe scattering, part of the scattering. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I would think that, that that would be correct. I would think we'd have to take this and relate it to uh, the period of time up to the fourth generation. And then that fourth generation, just like the 1260 is the fourth church, right? Thyatira. Um, that would be the fourth generation. So that there must be a connection there. And then we have, uh, this 30, 30 years, right? And you could say, well, you know, 1957 to 1989, and that's 32 years. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. But, but I would just say that this has to, this is something that has to happen before our lines begin. So I wouldn't take the time times and a half here and put it in our history, like in the present truth movement. It is something that has to occur prior to the 1290 and the 1335 as symbols are going to commence. I'm not saying they're periods of time, like 1290 days or anything. Right. It would seem to be. Now, there's also in verse eight. So I'm kind of jumping ahead here. But it says, and I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Now, there was this question being asked from one of the angels on one of the bank, sides of the banks of the river to Christ was the question was how long. So they ask Christ how long. Christ is the man clothed in linen upon the waters of the river, and he's going to make an oath that it shall be for times, times and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished, right? Now, we have a number of words uh, that we need to take into consideration. So how long shall be the end of these wonders in verse 6? Well, you can see the word end there is case, right? And that's an extremity. 
It can mean a border or an end. We also have the word finished, uh, which means to end, whether in transitively to cease, be finished or perish, or transitively to complete, prepare, consume, accomplish, cease, you know, all these different things. But then the question that, that Daniel's going to ask is a little bit different. He says, I heard, but I did not understand, right? I understood not. And then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Now, this word end is akarith. It means the last or end, hence the future, also posterity, last, latter, time, hinder, uttermost, so uh, residue, reward. So what is he asking here? Why is he asking the question in this way? How is this different from what's being asked earlier? How long shall be the end of these wonders? All these things shall be finished. Um, what shall be the end of these things? All of those things address what we would call the end. But why is this specific question? What is it that Daniel is not understanding and that he wants to understand with this question? So Daniel's been told that his book's going to be sealed and shut up even to the time of the end, right? Okay. So he's going to have the time of the end, the cates, the extremity. And then he's going to be shown this vision, right, of what's happening, this question being asked, and Christ answering this question. But he's not going to understand, right? So he doesn't understand. He hears it. So he hears what the words are, but he doesn't understand it. That is, he can't separate it mentally or distinguish it. So it's not that he can't understand what the words are. He can't understand what the meaning is. And so then he asks the question, what shall be the end of these things? And it's a different word, end. Now, the answer to that is, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So there is something here that it doesn't seem like Daniel is going to understand. These words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. And it appears that they're sealed to Daniel as well. That, that this, that the answer to this question is not given. So he's going to be given this answer, uh, which is not really answering his question, just that, that he's not going to get the answer to that question. But he's going to be given lots of other information. You know, many shall be purified and made white and tried. Now we know that that, that goes back to, um, Daniel chapter 11, verse, I can't remember which verse it is, where it talks about that, but in a different order. That the wicked will not understand, but the wise shall understand. So we know that this is an answer to this question, what shall be the end of these things? That there are two classes. One class will understand, one will not at the time of the end. And then he gives a more detail, right? From the time that the daily shall be taken away, the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days, right? So we know that in Millerite history, that that is going to be when the time of the end is, and that's when the book of Daniel will uh, be unsealed, right, at the end of the 1290. And then it says, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days, right? So we're given that. 45 years, but go thou thy way till the end be. So obviously, you know, Daniel's has to wait till the end of time for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. So of course, not referring to him personally, but to his book, to his message that's going to be unsealed at the end. So that end is 1798, but the other end um, the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end, right? So that's going to be 1798. But the question that he has, what shall be the end of these things, is not answered. It's it's going to be sealed. So when is that end? This 319, Akarith. It means after. Because he could be basically saying, what shall be after these things? Like after the time of the end. After all these things that you've talked about. So mostly that word's translated after, sometimes translated behind, but that just is another way of understanding after, but we would think of that as the past, but really it means what's going to happen after. Afterward, what's going to follow, the following, posterity, 
this it's again, uh, again, once after, um, again, backside here after a lived remnant and so forth. So, so the idea is he wants to know what will be the final outcome of these things. What's going to happen? All of these things that he's not going to be shown. Those, those things are going to be sealed up until the time of the end. And in, in reality, when the book of Daniel is opened up, those things become understood as events unfold. So basically, he's being told, until those final events happen, they're not going to be understood, right? They're going to become understood as those events occur. And you can see, in a sense, why in chapter 10 of Revelation, when it says there shall be time no longer. Now, we know that that's the opening up of the little book, right? So we have the opening up of the little book in verse Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound and the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake uh, unto me again and said, go take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel and stand, stand it upon the sea and upon the earth, which stand upon the sea, upon the earth. Uh, and he has to take this little book and eat it. It's going to be bitter in his belly and made sweet in his mouth as honey. And, and if we go back to verse six, too, where it says there should be time no longer. Now, Ellen White's quite clear um, uh, what that means, that there should be time no longer. So what does she say about it? What does it the time no longer mean? Prophetic time. OK, she says uh, this time, which the angel declares with the solemn oath, is not the end of this Earth, this world's history, neither of pro- probationary time, but of prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. So now, now, some people would just say that after 1844, you can't have any time at all. But this is talking about probationary time. This is talk or, or prophetic time, right? So it's talking about the time of the end of the prophetic periods. Do the prophetic periods end in 1844? Can we extend them past 1844? Like when we take the prophetic mirror and we have 1863, are we extending the prophetic periods past 1844. When, when we use time in our in our time, are we are we disregarding this council? I would say no. no. Okay, so what's the basis? Me, for, no, as well. Yeah, like symbolic use of no numbers. Well. Yes. Okay, so so we are we're not we're not taking the prophetic periods and extending them. The prophetic periods ended in 1844. We we'd all agree with that. So. So what is it we have in our time that we can use time in the way that we have? What is what is the what is it that we're doing that is in accordance with the counsel in the spirit of prophecy? Can we know when Christ is going to return? We would have to say not no. Not the day or the hour, not the day or the hour, but the season. It's actually a sin not to know it. Okay, so we can watch and wait. We can know that it's approaching, and, and in order to know that it's approaching. We have to be observing things, right? Now, in order to understand the events that are happening around us, we need to be, we need to understand the lines. That is, we need to understand the relation of those events to the repeat of history. That, that's what this movement is all about. We believe that history is being repeated and that, so when we just take an event, so I go back to when you know, I was first an Adventist, you know, the first 10 years or so of being a Seventh-day Adventist, maybe the first 10 or 15 years. And there would be, you know, something in the news about something the Pope did. And people would think, oh, the Sunday law is coming, right? It's just around the corner. This this is going to lead to the Sunday law. And, and we continue to do that. Seventh-day Adventists do that all the time, even people in this movement. They keep thinking that they're that that's watching and waiting. But the thing is, they have no context in which to understand the repeat of history. What this movement has given 
to the Seventh-day Adventist church is the prophetic pattern that we can see that we're repeating Millerite history, that, you know, the time of the end in 1989 is, a, is, a, is paralleling the time of the end in 1798. And, and the first angel's message that's being paralleled in our history going up to, to 9-11, the second angel arrives at 9-11. 9-11 is also an empowerment of the first angel. And more specifically, we come to understand that, that our history is, is a zoom into or a type of something that's happening on a bigger scale. So the things happening in our movement are not the events on the bigger line that Jeff initially had. Right? The Sunday law, in a sense, begins at 9-11. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at 9-11. But it's, it's a zoom into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel. It's the Sunday law. But the Sunday law is not here yet. So the Sunday law is coming. And we, we understood this, too. We didn't really do it in these studies, but we did it in the Friday night studies, dealing with what A.T. Jones and Alan White were saying in 1892 about the angel of Revelation 18 arriving in that history, which is typical of what's happening in our history. So if we put that into context, if we take this and understand this repeat of history of what this movement is, we are repeating Millerite history. And these things that have to happen that, that Daniel is being given um, and that we see here in being fulfilled in Revelation chapter 10 in Millerite history, these have to be typical of what happens in our history. So this, if we go back to, to Daniel chapter 12, and we look at this whole section dealing with the time, times and a half, which is the first half of the 2520, that is the first half of the indignation, which is the scattering of the power of the holy people. That has to happen in our history. That would be the history between the Millerite movement, if we're going to apply it in our time, and the time of the end in our history. Now, there's also then the 1290 and the 1335. So we're not taking them literally. We're not trying to mix them up as days or anything like that. But we would have to say that there is a period of time in the church once we have the fourth generation. So the fourth generation is going to arrive in 1957. That's where we have marked it. We're marking it with the Seventh-day Adventist answer questions on doctrine, right? So that book, the publication of that book, marks the beginning of the fourth generation. The third generation began with the doctrine of Christ, right? And then we have questions on doctrine. So that third generation from 1919 to 1957. And then we have uh, the fourth generation. And it's in the fourth generation that we have the time of the end, right? That, that happens in Millerite history too, the fourth at the end of the fourth church. Now, in a sense, that darkness continues. So there's a reform line that begins in 1798. But the darkness continues, and we have this increase of light. So, so the same thing has happened in our history. So if we're going to place this, this, this question that Daniel, that Daniel has. So first we're going to have the question, how long shall be the end of these wonders? And then the answer is going to be about if we're going to apply to our history, because we're comparing this to Millerite history. We know that there are things that have to occur before we can even uh, talk about the time of the end. That is, the man of sin has to be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all things that, that are called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing that he is God. And, and that's going to be talked about. The time that the daily shall be taken away, chapter 12, verse 11. So that's going to be the first 1260 and the abomination that make it desolate set up. That's going to be the second 1260, right? So there's this transition period of 30 years between them. That's why it's not going to be 1260. It's going to be 1,290 days that they're going to refer to. And then there's going to be blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. Now, the 1,305 and 30 days in Millerite history, that's going to, that's going to mark the first day of the first month arriving, correct? At the 1335. So that's going to be April 18th at sunset. That's 
you, you wait and you come, and then you're going to receive this blessing. So those who pass the first test will receive the blessing. And the blessing is the second angel's message in Millerite history. So in our history, would this blessing then be the 1335? Would that be 9-11 in, in the bigger line in our history? Right. So not, that would not, be an interesting application. Yeah, because, well, we already, already have said that 9-11 is the first day of the first month. So, so that's where Daniel is going to be given his answer. Like he wants to know all of the end, the ultimate thing of all of these things, right? That's what, when he says, uh, what shall be the end of these things? I want to know what's going to happen after that, but that's not going to be given to him. What's going to be given to him is the starting of the end, so to speak, the time of the end, the events that are going to happen in Millerite history. But he's not going to be shown our history. But we can see that it's going to parallel our history. That's basically what Daniel is being told. That, that all of these things, because the answer that he wants has to do with the ultimate end when Christ comes back. But he's going to be given this history of Millerite history. But that history typifies our history. And then that history, Millerite history, is going to be sealed up in the seven thunders. And in our history, the seven thunders are going to be unsealed. So that's what Revelation chapter 10 is telling us. So again, when we look at Revelation chapter 10, we know that this is talking about the experience of the Millerites, this eating of the little book. But Ellen White says that, that it's going to be connected with the end of prophetic time, right? The prophetic periods. That's that's what this history is. But this history is going to be sealed up, but it has to be unsealed. So when are the seven thunders unsealed? So let's let's go back here. So 17, he, what's that? 17, 17, 1798 to 1844. No, that's when the, the, they're sealed up then. But when are they unsealed? Right. So they're sealed up. Millerite history is going to unfold. Because we can see the parallel between Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 10. They're talking about the same history. But Revelation chapter 10 is not prophesying that history. It's describing its fulfillment and says this history is going to be fulfilled, right? Because we're going to see the little bit book open in his hand, right? In verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book open, right? So this is when this prophecy is fulfilled, the prophecy of, of Daniel chapter 12. And we see this another mighty angel come down from heaven, right, which is Christ. Ellen White says this is no less the personage than Jesus Christ. And he has in his hand a little book open, right? He sets his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the land. So we have the left and the right again here. But in this case, it's not hands, it's feet, right? And there isn't one on one side of the bank and one on the other. There's just Christ here. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So this is the exposition of Millerite history as it's going to occur. But they're not going to under they're not going to understand that history. Like their own history that they experienced, they don't have a full understanding of. So when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So whatever the seven thunders uttered is not written down, but it's sealed up, even though it's not written down, right? So it's going to be sealed, but it will be understood at some point, right? It's not that it won't ever be un unsealed. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, right? And he swear by him that liveth forever and ever that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice when the seventh angel of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, I believe that that word finish there has to do much more with um, the question that Daniel is asking, because he wants to really know the end of these wonders. That's teleo, that is to be complete. So the, the complete expiration of time. Um, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me, uh, spake unto me again and said, go to take 
hit the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. So he's going to take this little book and eat it. Now, we know in, in Millerite history, this little book is going to be eaten. And it's going to be bitter in their belly, but sweet in their mouth as honey. And so and so uh, John is going to take that little book out of the angel's hand and eat it. right? And that's going to happen to him. Sweet in his mouth as honey. But as soon as he had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And then he said unto me, uh, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So this, this, these events of Millerite history that happen at the time of the end, when the little book is unopened, uh, it's unsealed, it's opened, right? Unopened, it's opened, unsealed. And it said the time shall be no longer. So the prophetic periods have ended. The prophetic time has ended. But there still is this mystery because there still is going to be time, right? That is, just because the prophetic periods have ended doesn't mean that the end has occurred, right? The Millerites thought the end would occur when the prophetic periods ended. But Ellen White says it's not the end of probationary time or the end of this world's history, but a prophetic time that is to precede the advent of our Lord. So all of the prophetic time has been used up. And we're now in this period in which there is no more prophetic time. That is, the prophetic periods have ended, and we're in those final events. We're in the things that happen after the question that Daniel asked. What what shall be the end of these things? That's what he wanted to know, and that's what he wasn't given. So since the seven thunders are, are sealed up, and they are the experience of the Millerites, the only way that they can be unsealed is in a repeat of history. That is, this movement has unsealed the seven thunders. The seven thunders are not seven way marks in Millerite history. They are Millerite history. The seven thunders themselves are are something that has sealed up Millerite history. And as we go through our history, we have unsealed those seven thunders. The movement has understood Millerite history. We now know, you know, the way marks in Millerite history. Now, you could argue there's seven of them, but the way marks themselves are not thunders. And it's not like one thunder seals up one way mark, right? We're not, we're not saying that the, that there's, the, and I know maybe that distinction doesn't make sense to everyone, but we did not, we did not understand Millerite history in the order that Millerite history occurred. As we repeated Millerite history, God gave us an understanding of Millerite history, but it wasn't directly in order. It's not like we had to go through midnight before we understood midnight and go through the midnight cry before we understood the midnight cry. Because many of these events in our lines are still future. We've never got to midnight yet, but we went through an experience that helped us understand Millerite history. So I would say it doesn't tell you specifically in Revelation 10 how the seven thunders are unsealed. But we would have to say the fact that they're sealed up means that they have to be unsealed. And especially if we see the parallel with Daniel chapter 12. And so the only way that they could be unsealed is in a repeat of the history of the Millerite movement, which is what this movement has been doing. And we still continue to repeat that history. I mean, that's the the whole basis of this movement is the repeat of Millerite history. Now, now I'm saying that we understand the seven thunders, that they have been unsealed. And, and that's because we, we experienced things that were parallel to Millerite history. So, so we experienced uh, things within our lines, within our history, um, such as the disappointment of July 18, 2020, that parallels October 22nd, 1844. And not only that, we, we've we've paralleled 1850, which is where we are now. So does that make sense to people? I don't, I'm not, you know, obviously I can't see your faces, can't see your expressions, how you're taking this. But I, I think make, this has to be the way we look at it. What's that, Kelly? Make, 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 makes, makes sense to me, okay. for sure. Yeah. It's, it's like... Uh, they weren't unsealed and they were even hidden to us as things hidden as things happened. Um, we understood them much more later. Like, 
Yeah, and after they happen, we were able to look back and see the line, the hand of Palmona. Yeah. So, for instance, we knew we were repeating Millerite history. And then we, we set a date, just like the Millerites did. And we even did talk about, well, what happens if it doesn't occur? Well, that would parallel October 22, 1844. But then we dismissed it. We pushed it aside. So, so back in 2020, so on, on April 26th, I emailed Jeff showing him that, uh, the July 18, 2020 prediction was on a line of failed predictions. And I said, you know, it's possible that it may not occur. And that if it didn't occur, that, that we would have a reason to understand why it didn't occur. That, that this is a part of failed predictions and that we're repeating Millerite history. And, and so I, I, I sent him a video I had done on it. I sent him my study notes and he said, I'll take a look at these and I'll get back to you, which he never did. And then he was still doing the, the presentations at the School of the Prophets. And prior to that, he was talking a bit about, you know, Jonah, his prediction, you know, 40 days and, and paralleling that. He was also paralleling uh, our experience to Abraham offering up Isaac, right? Because in the idea that we were doing something that appeared to be against God's plainly written word, but did Abraham offer up Isaac? His hand was stayed. So in both of those examples that Jeff used, we should have seen that we're going to experience Millerite history, that we're going to have this disappointment. But for some reason, my studies were ignored. Whether he ever watched them or read it, I don't know. So, so that, you know, that to me was something that we should have done. We should have recognized that we were going to have this disappointment. If we ate the little book, wouldn't we have this bitter experience? But when we have the bitter experience, instead of recognizing that we were repeating Millerite history, which seemed like the obvious thing to, to recognize, we believed that we had actually made a mistake, which was repeating Millerite history. Jeff was repeating the history of Miller. The movement was repeating the history of the Millerite movement. And instead, you have a, an insignificant preacher, James White, and and this teenage girl, you know, starting this new movement, so to speak, not something that they're planning to do, but they're just ignored by the movement and, and misrepresented to Miller. And this is exactly what we see happening presently. So if we're going to address this in our notes, you know, I'm not sure quite exactly how we could write this out. So and one said to the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river. So the waters of the river in our history represent what specifically? I mean, what, what do they represent in, in Millerite history? Because it, it doesn't represent people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So where are we going to find our primary reference to this that, that Daniel's talking about? Now, we know this river here is, is uh, the Tigris or the Hittite, right? Okay, so we got... We got this river. It's the Tigris. So can we look at it as a message about something? Now, I put here, you know, um, in for verse five, then I, Daniel, looked, right? That's the studying of the symbols in Millerite history. We have that 7200 and 1840, right? Behold, there stood other two, right? So we have um, uh, other two. The, the one on this side, the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. So this is a chiasm. It's a structural chiasm. So one of the things we study the symbols in Millerite history, we have an understanding of the, the structural chronological chiasms. And then one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. So can we say that the waters of the river represent a message? And if so, what message do they represent? Now, this is the Tigris. It's not the Euphrates, but it still does relate to that. Could the river represent movement? You know, movement? Well, well I say it represents a message. But yeah. how, how, why, why am I saying that? What would, what would be the reference that I would use to say that this river is the message. a message? Well, the message is moving. I mean, it's... Progressing, it's progressing. Okay, I see, I see what you're yeah, so rivers do flow. Okay, so when we look at river, the word river, 
there's going to be another re- river which is um, the Nile, right? That's Genesis 41, verse 1 to 3. So Daniel's going to interpret the dreams of the butler and the baker, and it came to the pass at the end of two full years. So it's going to be Pharaoh's birthday again, right? And behold, he stood by the river in this dream, and there was the, you know, the seven cows that come out that are well favored, they're fat, right? And then, and then he's going to see seven other cows come out and they're going to be skinny. And then he's going to see, just go to this verse. I know you can't see it, so I should switch this. So this is when Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams, right? So you got the ill favored kind, cows, cattle. And, um, and then he's going to have the corn. So there's going to be seven and seven. Now we know that these are seven years and seven years. So they represent a chiasm and, and we're going to have a river. So this is the first time uh, that we get, uh, the word river in the Bible. Genesis 41 verse one to three. So we never had that word river previous to these verses. Okay. So it's the law of first mention. So we have it first mentioned. Yeah, uh, something something uh, I want to throw on the table there is the uh, mm-hmm. book of Revelation, is it? The drying up of the river Euphrates. Yeah. And that drying up is not a literal drying up, but rather a drying up of the message of Babylon or something like this. Is that how that goes? Well, it, well, it would have to do with the support of the people for the Catholic Church. or for So the it, Pope, it right? is a message. A message associated with the river. That's my main point. Yeah. I mean, there are people always associated with messages, right? But rivers, rivers, but but rivers. Yeah. So, so we have this one here. So we have, um, this river. Now, another one that we have is in Ezekiel 29 three. So this is going to be again being talking about, uh, the Nile, right? Because this is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers, uh, which hath said, my river is mine own and I have made it for myself. So and then it's going to talk about it. Verse nine. And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste and they shall know that I am the Lord because he hath said the river is mine and I have made it. Now, we're going to also have everyone. Where is it? Ezekiel 30. I will make thy rivers dry and sell the land into the hand of the wicked. I will make the land waste. And again, in Daniel 12, Zechariah. So, so in these contexts, these rivers have to do with uh, these kingdoms. Oh, and, and again, um, Isaiah 7, verse 18. Uh, so July 18. Uh, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. So if we're going to address these rivers, now we we can say they represent, we we could say they represent the world, Egypt, right? But but this is the Tigris, so it's not the Nile in, in Daniel chapter 12. But it would have to do with a message about Babylon is my point. Does, does that make sense? That these What's water, the name of the river again? Well, it's the Tigris. It's called Hillel in 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 the Hebrew, but it refers to the Tigris River. Right. Okay, so I, I'm thinking, would it be, if not, well, the Egypt, the spiritualism, anything to do with that? Well, in this case, it's not Egypt, right? In Daniel 12, in this case, it's it's the river in Assyria. But I'm just paralleling. Oh. With the met- so it's Babylon. Yeah. So it's a message about Babylon. You know, it's not right. the Euphrates, but but they are part of the same river system. Uh, the Hittakil and the Euphrates are both part of that same same system. So we we have this this river, and there's one standing upon the waters of the river, and he's um, going to be asked this question: How long shall be the end of these wonders? Right, that word wonders related to Palmoni. So then. Uh, Daniel's going to hear Christ give this oath, right? So when he swears, that's that's an oath. That's to swear seven times. He's going to swear by himself, which is which Christ can do. So this is a covenant in a sense when he swears by himself. Um, but he's going to address first this period of 
what we call the daily, the time, times and a half. Paganism, that, that they have to do a work in accomplishing to scatter the power of the holy people. So that has to happen first, right, in this historical application, right? And then he's going to get into the 1290 and the 1335 and, and the transition from the daily to the abomination of desolation. But we're trying to make a present truth application of this. So that we, means that this, this message that is, is proclaimed here, right? Because I'm, I'm saying it's a message. And, and we can see that this is a message dealing with, in this history historically, dealing with paganism. But what would that message parallel be in our time? Now, we, we would say that it has to do with the period of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, right? That there's the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there's a message that has to be given that, or rejected. So there's a message that's given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It ends up rejecting that message. So can we say that that the Seventh Day Adventist Church has been scattered? That the message that it it wants to give that Babylon is fallen, right? The Protestant churches are fallen. The Seventh Day Adventist Church has now really wanted to be Protestant. Correct. Amen. They're not given a message. I mean, we're we're seeing these things like. 3,000 baptisms all over the place in the Philippines and so on. Yeah. And people think that that is, that is it. It's the beginning of it, it. But I do question, you know, that there will be false revivals. Will they be in the Adventist church as well? False revivals or well, is this something outside of the church? So some people, and the other question that goes with that is how many people will, will, be there in five years as Adventists? Well, what we're seeing in a lot of these places from people who've sort of looked into it in more detail is that people aren't being prepared properly for baptism, for one. They're not really being given a true message. They're not being given a foundation. I mean, they hardly know what it is to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And, and really many of these are nominal conversions. That is, they're not really going to effectually change their life. So they're bringing many people into the church, just as you see in North America, who are unconverted, have no idea what it means to be an Adventist, have had no real true conversion. Um, I know, I know, I know one of the things that goes through the mind of people in, in poorer countries is that it'll improve their, their living stand, standard of living as well by joining the church. So that's, that's a big draw. Yes. Yeah. So for many people, it, it is more a a social move rather than um, a, a conversion. It has to do with social status. And also, you know, they save up all of these people for these big baptisms to make a huge show of them. Right. Mm-hmm. So there, there's no reason to have to bat. But, you know, they think if they make this big show, then it's going to be a big witness and they'll bring more people in. But you bring in people for the wrong reason, right? And, although and, I, I do, I, I although I do like what I'm seeing with uh, Sunday churches, whole churches coming and becoming Seventh Day Adventists. That that is interesting. That's yeah, happening. it is interesting. It has happened for a while. But it's the kind of countries where it's happening too. So again, this may be a social status thing. It's hard to know. Okay. I mean, well, the largest, the largest Protestant church in india just invited doug bachelor to speak mm-hmm. that's like i think it was a membership of yeah. uh, twenty thousand or something yeah and, and i think for many but, advent this, this is going to be a witness you know that god is moving but if it's not if it's not the truth that's being presented you know if it's a watered down mm-hmm. message then mm-hmm. it, it's definitely not what ellen white prophesied that would happen at the end of time. How would that look? Well, it would, she says it wouldn't be according to, uh, what's the words, uh, man's machinery. It'd be evident that God had taken the work into his own hands. And take the rain in his own hands. People would go from house to house with their faces lighted up and sharing the word of God. Right? People will be coming. I saw to- that. I saw that as as a new Christian with the agape force. Oh yeah. It was a street ministry. That's how I became a Christian. And 
Mm-hmm. I remember seeing them across the street after I hadn't seen them for a, a year. And then mm-hmm. next summer, they're knocking on doors across the street. And it was, to me, it was like, that's what we need to do. Mm-hmm. Go to homes, individuals. Yeah. No, so. And so their faces were lighted up. Their faces mm-hmm. were lighted up as far as. Yeah. As me. yeah so we know that, that there is a message that the Adventist church has not received yet. That, that many people who come into the Adventist church are not going to know the truths that make us Seventh-day Adventists. They're going to have a very superficial understanding of what the Adventist church is about. You know, what we would call historic Adventism is definitely not going to be presented to them. They're not going to know Millerite history, really. Uh, you know, they're going to have a very sketchy understanding of things because it's, it's not, it's not about a message of understanding anymore. It's more about certain Bible truths, I guess, you know, the Sabbath, obviously, and, and healthy living and things like that. Uh, but that's not all that Adventism well, even, is. You just, you just pressed the button there. I was waiting. Like in terms of message that converts us, it converts our whole life or including our lifestyle. M- many Adventists will do the bare minimum, like they won't drink coffee in public or with get church and no, bring no pork to the to the potluck. Yeah. But in their homes, now, how can I say it? Um, that I know things about in the homes of elders and like high you know, conference leaders and so on that mm-hmm. that it would destroy their career. So if I I would think like drinking and pornography and all these things that are in their homes. Uh, so, and then there's new Adventists that I've met, been in the church for five or whatever, 10 years, and they're still drinking and, and smoking marijuana and yeah, and being deacons. But of course, those things aren't known about, but they, they don't see a problem with them, which is yeah. interesting. There are those nominal conversions. I mean, I can see that people can sometimes struggle with things, but yes, the difference between the struggle and participation, accepting accepting that it's okay to claim from others, that's that's obviously different. Yeah, yeah. Well, knowing you're wrong, and like Paul, those that which I would not, I do, but they would, so they don't see it as wrong. It's the thing they're not struggling with it; they're just going with it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, and so, so we can't look at struggling as the same thing because people do struggle. They go through times of discouragement. Uh, I would be, as you know, Theodore, I would be the last one to pass that right. minute, point a finger at anybody that struggles. Yeah. And I still believe that God is working in their life because they're yeah. struggling with it. Yeah. yeah. But when, when people today, have. Care the, the day people don't care is the day they die spiritually. But yeah, when people make excuses for it and then and hide it from others as if it's not happening and have positions in the church and continue to do these things and justify them, that that's that's, of course, that's the key. Justify. justify. Yeah. Rationalize. Yeah. So so we can see anyway, the point is that there is a message that that so I would say that this represents the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This Christ standing upon the waters, holding up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven. This is the message of the prophetic periods. This is the message of Millerite history. That's what he's pointing to. And that message has been lost in Adventism. And that and this movement, so this is the seven times, right? This is the 2520. That's the message that's actually being talked about here. And that message has been lost to Adventism. <clears throat> and I believe that that message has to be given to Adventism. Now, you know, we talked before in some of the other studies, and I talked with you yesterday on the phone, you know, just about, um, you know, j- the supernatural hatred towards the 2520, which, which doesn't make any sense, right? So the 2520... That, that, that anybody would even care that somebody believed in the 2520. To me, it, it's just amazing. Like, how is that a threat to the church? It's not some, you know, it's not, you know, 
Seventh Day Adventists. It's not, it's not, you know, um, uh, some kind of new theology. It's not, uh, you know, it's not some the weird, in the future. like you'll have to keep the feasts or anything. We're not, in a sense, mm-hmm. even telling anybody anything of that they should do different. All we're telling people is, hey, there's something that we understood in the past. Let's look into this and see if we can understand our history. And and that's that's a fearful thing. Adventists don't want to do that. Now, I think part of it is just 2520, just to people, it just was this number and they didn't know what it meant. And it's just an irrational fear. It's like when you, you know, you're scared of snakes and you jump because you see the garden hose. Mm. You know, it, it, it doesn't follow to be scared of it. Like once somebody actually looked at the 2520, and when I have shown people what it actually was about, most people, most Adventists would say, well, what's the big fuss? Like, I, I don't see what they're upset about. But, you know, they just know that it was something that the church was upset about, so it must be something dangerous. But that's what the message is, as far as I'm concerned, that the message that's being dis- discussed here in that's being given to Daniel that we are to apply to our time is it is a message about Millerite history, the understanding of chronological chiasms and the understanding of the 2520. That is what has to be presented to Adventists. Yeah. One one of the things I think I figured out with why uh, was, was, uh, okay. So Adventists have been prepared to reject new light. Because there's been so much apostasy, oh. like, you know, oh, that's just another Waco, Texas, or that's just another whatever. Mm-hmm. And so when anything new comes along, it's quite easy to reject it and to just trust leadership rather than put in that personal effort to study it just a little bit. Yeah, that's, we also, that's what happened. Yeah, and we also do have a problem a little bit with some of the types of people who were promoting the 2520. That is, they, right. they weren't necessarily doing it in a good spirit, you know. Or they've been a little bit of a little bit of a stir stir stick in the past with, on different issues. Yeah. Exactly. Or just had to deal with them or whatever. Yeah. Some some of comes the, a fellow that not all of been. Them been in the church for over 30 years and has this thought about the 2520 well never had a problem before you know sabbath school teacher deacon etc and yeah but this 2520 you gotta go yeah i know okay well anyway we're gonna close with prayer so thanks for those comments and uh, we'll come back to this tomorrow Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning, and I pray that you can bless each person in in their day, and that you can bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. Um, We ask for your angels' care and protection, and that we can follow and serve you and be obedient in all things. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.